This episode of The Sinful Show is sponsored by Podcoin. Podcoin, you say, what's that? Well, it's this new app that pays you to listen to Podcoins. You're in Podcoin by listening to podcasts. That's right. All you got to do is download the app Podcoin on your Apple phone or Android device. Listen to, to any of your podcasts that you listen to, including The Sinful Show, and earn Podcoin. And with those Podcoin, you can uh, buy Amazon, Starbucks gift cards, and there's even a set of Bose headphones on there. But if you're awesome like me, you could donate those Podcoin to charity. We donate our Podcoin to the Childhood uh, Cancer Research. Again, that's Podcoin. If you use the code SINFUL, when you sign up, S-Y-N-F-U-L, you'll get 300 Podcoin on me. Check it out, guys. Labada me, labada me, labada me, labada me. DDT did a real job on me. Now I'm a real sickie. Yeah, you didn't come here to hear that, did you? Yeah, my voice is a little shot this week. Had a little cold. Been going through the household. The whole sinful family's been sick. But you know what? The show must go on. And yes, this week we are talking about the lobotomy. And we're going to be talking about one of the big doctors behind that that did this uh, tremendous medical procedure. Oh my God, this shit's fucking crazy, guys. Are you sinners ready for this? Let's get into the story of lobotomy. Walter Freeman is known in history as the father of the lobotomy, an infamous procedure that involved hammering an ice pick-like instrument into a patient's brain through their eye sockets. The horrifying procedure often left patients in a vegetative state and is responsible for an estimated 490 deaths. Walter Freeman was born on November 14th, 1895, and was raised by his parents in Philadelphia. As a child, he did not show much interest in the field of medicine, despite his father, Walter Jackson Freeman, being an otelerinologist. Oh my God, I just fucked that up. Basically, it's a doctor that specializes in ears, nose, and throat problems. That's what that is. Uh, Big words I'm not good with. But anyways, and his paternal, not paternal, but maternal grandfather, Williams, William Keene, I said that totally backwards, a prominent surgeon. After graduating from Yale University, he enrolled as a medical student at the University of Pennsylvania and earned a medical degree in 1920. Freeman worked as a pathology intern at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania before traveling to Europe to study neurology in 1923. He returned to the United States a year later, taking a position as the director of laboratories at a leading psychiatric institution in Washington, D.C., St. Elizabeth's Hospital practicing as the first neurologist in the city. Working at the institution, Freeman witnessed the pain and distress suffered by mentally ill patients for the first time, which encouraged him to continue his education in the field. Over the next few years, he earned his Ph.D. in neuropathology and secured a position at George Washington University as head of the neurology department. 
Influenced by the devastating effects of mental illness, Freeman began using oxygen therapy and experimented with chemical treatments for patients. In 1935, Freeman learned of a frontal lobe ablation technique that had been used on chimpanzees with the effect of subduing their temperament. That same year, a new procedure intended to treat mental illness was performed in Portugal under the direction of neurologist and physician Igas Monez, called a leuctomy, leuctomy, my God, medical terms I suck with, which took small corings out of the frontal lobes. Freeman modified the procedure, renaming it a lobotomy. He believed that excess emotions led to mental illness and that severing certain nerves in the brain could stabilize a person's personality. With the help of neurosurgeon James Watts, Freeman performed his first prefrontal lobotomy operation in the United States on a 63-year-old woman who was suffering from insomnia and agitated depression. The operation involved drilling six holes in the top of the patient's skull, and when it was finished, she emerged transformed and lived for another five years. Freeman and Watts performed a number of lobotomies carried out at his practice, private practice in Washington, D.C. He soon developed a more efficient way to perform the procedure without drilling into a person's head. It involved rendering a patient unconscious by electroshock before inserting a sharp ice pick-like instrument above the patient's eyeball. The instrument would be hammered into the skull and wiggled back and forth in order to sever the connections to the prefrontal cortex and the frontal lobes of the brain. Four hours later, the patient awoke without any anxiety or apprehension. In reality, the procedure resulted in leaving many patients in a vegetative state or reducing them to childlike behavior. Despite its shortcomings, many hospitals adopted the procedure for no other apparent reason than the fact that lobotomized patients were easier to handle than emotionally charged ones. Freeman began traveling across the country visiting mental institutions and spreading the use of the lobotomy by training staff to perform the operation. Despite much criticism toward the uh, controversial procedure, it gained popularity through major publications across the country, hailing the lobotomy as a miracle surgery. By 1949, 5,000 lobotomies were being performed annually, up from 150 in 1945. Freeman himself would ultimately go on to lobotomize more than 2,900 patients, including 19 children younger than the age of 18. He became overzealous, completing more than 20 lobotomies in a day without the use of a, without a, use of a surgeon. A showman himself, he liked to shock his audi- audiences by inserting two picks into each eye socket at the same time. He even allowed the media to watch a lobotomy be performed that ended in a death as the sharp instrument slipped into the patient's brain. Freeman reacted indifferently to the patient's death and continued on to the next patient to do another surgery. A total of 490 individuals are estimated to have died as a result of a lobotomy. For the survivors, some were left with no noticeable differences, but others were crippled for life or lived in a persistent vegetative state. One of Freeman's most notable patients was John F. Kennedy's sister, who was born with mild learning difficulties. She was given a lobotomy in 1941 with the consent of her father, but it ended in failure. She was left incapacitated by the procedure and spent the rest of her life in and out of various institutions. Long-term studies on the effects of lobotomy, however, eventually began to surface, and many supporters of the procedure began to abandon it. 
Freeman performed his last lobotomy in 1967 after uh, severing a patient's blood vessel during the procedure, resulting in his death three days later. So that was some quick insight of one of the forefathers of lobotomy here in the United States. But here's a story about Howard Dolly. At the age of 12, Howard Dolly was given a lobotomy, one of thousands performed by the notorious Dr. Walter Freeman. Now, Dolly has written a forceful account of his survival and sheds light on the man who subjected him to one of the most brutal, not brutal, but most brutal surgical procedures in medical history. When Howard Dolly met the man who was to change his life forever, he was not sure what to make of him. He was 11 at the time and paid little attention to the mysterious adult world that surrounded him. To the decisions taken without his knowledge or to the profound impact that Dr. Walter Freeman would have on his pre-adolescent existence. Instead, with a child's eye, he noticed a small physical quirks. The round rim glasses, the dapper suit, the well-trimmed goatee. It made him look a little like a beatnik, Dolly said. He was warm, personable, and easy to get along with. Was I fearful? No. I had no idea what he was going to do with me. Dolly was, was a withdrawn boy who liked riding his bicycle and playing chess. He occasionally fought with his brother disobeyed his parents, and stole sweets from the kitchen cupboards. He had a weekly paper round and was saving up to buy a record player. According to Dr. Freeman's meticulous records, Dolly was 62 inches tall and weighed six and a half stone. He was an average child. Perhaps a little unruly, but nothing that would strike one as exceptional for a boy of his age. But Howard Dolly would soon become exceptional for all the wrong reasons. Barely two months after this first meeting, his father and stepmother had him admitted to a private hospital in his hometown of San Jose, California. At 1.30 p.m. on 16 December 1960, he was wheeled into an operating theater and given a series of electroshocks to sedate him. That much he remembers. The rest is murky. When Dolly walked the next day, his eyes were swollen and bruised, and he was running a high fever. He recalls a severe pain in his head and the discomfort of his hospital gown, which gaped open at the back. He had no idea what had happened. I was in a mental fog, Dolly said. I was like a zombie. I had no awareness of what Freeman had done. What he didn't know was that he had been subjected to one of the most brutal surgical procedures in medical history. He had undergone a lobotomy and no one, not his parents, not the medical community, or the state authorities had intervened to stop it. More disturbingly, there seemed to have been no obvious necessity for the operation. If Dolly appeared superficially vacant or mildly aggressive, there was some obvious explanations. His mother died of cancer when he was five, and his father, Rodney, later remarried to a cold and demanding woman called Lou, who found her new stepson's natural ebulence and physical strength almost impossible to control. Relations between the two deteriorated so that Dolly grew up in an atmosphere of emotional abuse and casual neglect. He was given regular beatings and forced to eat meals on his own. Increasingly convinced that there was something emotionally wrong with her stepson, Lou started consulting psychiatrists and mental health experts before eventually being referred to Dr. Freeman, a renegade physician disowned by the mainstream establishment who ran a private practice in Los Altos, 
just outside of San Francisco. Freeman diagnosed Dolly as a schizophrenic. He is clever at stealing, but always leaves something behind to show what he's done. Freeman recorded in his notes from October 1960. If it's a banana, he throws the peel at the window. If it's a candy bar, he leaves a wrapper around someplace. He does a good deal of daydreaming, and when asked about it, he says, I don't know. He is defiant at times. You tell me to do this, and I'll do that. He has a vicious expression on his face some of the time. Sounds like a typical preteen kid to me. Discarded sweet wrappers, daydreaming spells, and an odd glimpse of youthful defiance. It would appear to be a relatively innocuous list, but it was enough for Freeman. Eight weeks after the doctor first saw him, Dolly came round from his operation in a state of numbed confusion. The hospital reported report stated that he had been given a transorbital lobotomy. A sharp instrument was thrust through the orbital roof on both sides and moved so as to sever the brain pathways in the frontal lobes. Dr. Freeman's bill came to $200. Dolly was his youngest ever patient. Extraordinarily, he survived. People freak out when they realize the person they are talked to had a lobotomy, he said 47 years later. Sitting under a corrugated iron awning outside his trailer home on the outskirts of San Jose. They expected me to be drooling. Over the years, the lobotomy has become more as a character of itself. Cultural shorthand immediately conjures up images of zombies or dribbling madmen. Even the word itself sounds freakish and unwildly, like an ill-judged verbal joke. For most people, it remained inevitably associated with dramatic invention, with the days and incoherent character of Catherine and Tennessee Williams suddenly last summer, or with Jack Nicholson's Oscar-winning performance as a deranged asylum inmate and one flew over the cuckoo's nest. But for a time in the 1930s and 40s, the procedure was at the forefront of neurosurgery. Viewed by the medical establishment as a cutting-edge treatment for mental illness. Before the introduction of antipsychotic drugs or the popularization of psychotherapy, the lobotomy was touted as a miracle cure for anything from schizophrenia to postnatal depression and just not and not just in the United States. Neurologists in the UK are estimated to have carried out 50,000 variants of the operation until the late 70s. Derek Hutchison, a 62-year-old grandfather, underwent a lobotomy in 1974 without his consent. He says at the hands of surgeon Arthur E. Wall, while patient at the High Roids Asylum near Leeds, unlike Dolly, Hutchison was awake throughout his operation when a psychiatrist had insisted would curb his aggressive tendencies. Mr. Hutchinson describes it as a situation you should only go through once in your life. And that's when you're dying. It felt like a broom handle was being pushed in my brain. And my head was splitting it apart. Originally developed by Portuguese physician Antonio Igues Monez in 1936, the the lobotomy involved drilling two small small holes in either side of the forehead and severing the connecting tissues around the frontal lobes. The hope was to dull the symptoms of psychiatric illnesses by reducing the strength of emotional signals produced by the brain. Although Menez won the Nobel Prize for his pioneering work in 1949, he insisted that it should only be used as a last resort in cases where every other form of treatment had been unsuccessfully tried. But then good old Walter Freeman jumps into the picture and um, 
you know, the United States has always had an issue with mental health one way or another. I'm sure a lot of us have seen that. I mean, it's pretty bad. But at this time, the state legislature paid a pitiful $2 a day per patient to cover their upkeep. So some that included the staff salaries, catering, accommodation, and treatment. Spurred on by his firsthand experience of the horrors of state-run mental institutions and determined to make his first, make his name as a medical pioneer. Freeman developed the version of Monez's procedure that reached the frontal lobe tissue through the tear ducts. The transorbital lobotomy involved taking a kitchen ice pick, later refined into a more proficient instrument called a uh, leukotomy, leukotome, L-E-U-C-O-T-O-M-E, another medical word that I suck with, and hammering it through the thin layer of the skull in the corner of each eye socket. The pick would then be scrambled from side to side in order to damage the frontal lobe. The process took about 10 minutes and could be performed anywhere without the assistance of a surgeon. And over the years, Freeman developed a reckless enthusiasm for the operation, driving several thousand miles across the country to carry out demonstrations at asylums and hospitals. As said before, he was the showman. He'd sometimes I pick both the eyes at the same time, one with each hand. He had a buccaneering disregard for the usual medical formalities. He chewed gum while he operated and displayed impatience with what he called all that germ crap, routinely failing to sterilize his hands or wear rubber gloves. Despite a 14% fatality rate, Freeman performed 3,439 lobotomies in his lifetime. Oh, goodness. Oh, and on um, John F. Kennedy's sister, Rose, she did live until she was 86 up until uh, 2005, but she did live in all those other institutions. But yet occasionally the operation appeared to have a calming, desensitizing effect on the mentally ill. The lobotomy's mixed success rate was a symptom of its imprecision it was a hit-and-miss procedure developed at the time when little was known about the very specific nature of the brain structure. Dolly's almost total recovery is thus an anomaly. To look at him, you'd never guess that he underwent such brutal surgery. There's no slowness of speech, no telltale squinting of the eyes, None of the lack of social inhibition that characterizes most lobotomy survivors. He had a full-time job training uh, school bus drivers. Had a, had a marriage to a woman named Barbara, a son named Rodney, a stepson named Justin, and a tabby cat he calls Princess. He also wrote, an autobiography called My Lobotomy, which was co-written with the jur journalist Charles Fleming, which was published in the U.S. and published in the U.K. Mr. Dolly says he, don't, he, he doesn't feel physically different from anyone else. He says, I get eye infections because I think they destroyed my tear ducts. But the most unusual thing you would notice about me is my size. Dolly's father never apologized, but Dolly remains astonishingly sanguine about the operation and checkered at the legacy it left him. For years of lobotomy, he was in and out of mental institutions, jails, and halfway houses. He was homeless, drug addicted, and an alcoholic. A petty criminal with little concept of how to live a normal life. 
I think I was angry at society for a long time, but I went through that and how I don't think there's any point in dwelling on it. I blame everyone for what happened, including myself. I was a mean little ruffian. His stepmom, Lou, was looking for a way to get me out of the house for a solution of the problem, and Freeman was looking for a subject. Both of them came together and whoop a dee doo I don't think Freeman was evil. I think he was just misguided. He tried to do what he thought was right, and he just couldn't give it up. And that was the problem. In many ways, Walter Freeman was shaped as much by human frailty as his patience. Born in Philadelphia, he was driven from a young age to exemplary growing up in the long shadow cast by his grandfather, mentioned before William Keen. He was motivated part, partly by interest in the well-being of his patients and then also by this very urgent need to feel like he was someone who was accomplishing great things. Jack... L hi, I think I pronounced this E L H A I. Uh, this that was explained by him. He's the author of the Lobotomist, a biography of Freeman. She grew more personally attached to the lobotomy. He became more irrational. The more the mainstream medical establishment derided Freeman's methods with the advent of fru- uh, Freudian psychoanalysis and antipsychotic drugs such as Thorazine in the mid-50s, the lobotomy fell out of favor. The more defensive Freeman became, he took pride in what he called shrink-baiting and wrote disobliging limericks about his professional enemies, once saying he would rather be wrong than be boring. By the time Freeman operated on Dolly in 1960, he was working exclusively from a private practice. No state hospital would touch him. Freeman's home life unraveled alongside his professional reputation. His wife, Marjorie, was an alcoholic, and Freeman had numerous affairs. In 1946, Freeman had witnessed the horrific death of his 11-year-old son, Keen, on a camping trip in Yosemite National Park. Keen was bending down at the top of the waterfall to fill up his flask when he lost his footing and was swept over the brink. It was an experience that must have affected Freeman greatly, although he had made sparse mention of it later in his life. But perhaps it was telling that 14 years after the event, when he first met 11-year-old Howard Dudley, Freeman suggested that the two of them should not go hiking. My sense with Howard is that Freeman thought he was treating a family problem rather than just a boy's psychiatric problem, says L. High. But by the standards he used in earlier years, what he did was completely unjustifiable. Although Freeman ended up causing unforgivable harm, he was not essentially a bad man. After he died of complications arising from an operation for cancer in 1972, his four surviving children, Walter, Frank, Paul, and Lorne, became staunch defenders of their father's legacy. Two of them have carried on the family medical heritage. Paul's a psychiatrist in San Francisco, and the eldest, Walter Jr., is a professor, Emetrius of Neurobiology at the University of California. Walter Jr.'s twin, Frank, is a retired security guard living in a modest second-floor apartment in San Carlos, just a half hour's drive from Howard Dolly's home. He's a friendly giant of a man, dressed smartly in a double-breasted dark blue suit and burgundy tie kept in place by a thin gold clip. He was a marvelous father, Frank said, sitting in a room filled with a crossword dictionaries and Dick Francis novels. He loved his children and always made time for us out of his busy schedule. Took us camping every summer all across the country. Frank recalls being invited to observe a lobotomy when he was 21 and vividly remembers hearing a little crack as the orbital plate fractured. It only took about six or seven minutes, and Dad kept kept up a running commentary. 
Indeed, the original ice pick used for the first transorbital lobotomy came from the Freeman family kitchen drawer. We had several of them, says Frank, cheerfully. We used to we used to use them to punch holes in our belts when we got bigger. I'm enormously proud of my father. I do think he's been unfairly treated. He was an interventionalist surgeon, a pioneer, and that took guts. But however well intention is interventions, Freeman's lifelong quest for self Glorification meant that he failed to acknowledge when his methods were doing more harm than good. Frank thinks his father was justified in operating on young Howard Dolly, a boy on the brink of adolescence whose brain had barely begun his transformation to maturity. Frank and Howard used to have chats. The conversation he recalled. Frank said that growing up, Frank said that Howard said when he was growing up, he hated his stepmother and she was afraid of him. He was belligerent and uncooperative, frightening, if you like. And I'm convinced that if he'd gone on like that, he would have ended up in jail or a mental institution. Frequently, people like Howard have a lobotomy and sooner or later they straighten out. Howard's been self supporting for a number of years and he's married in a very pleasant relationship. It is impossible to say how Dolly's life would have panned out if he had not walked into Walter Freeman's office one long ago autumn day. Perhaps it would, like Frank says, have been inoculably worse, or perhaps it would have carried on much the same way. But it could have been better, too, and the true sadness is that Howard Dolly will never be able to find out one way or another. Let's talk about some mind-boggling facts and about the history of the lobotomy. 1890, German scientist Friedrich Goltz experiments with removing the temporal lobe from dogs and reports a calming effect. Well, you could have gave him a red rocket and that might have calmed him down. 1892, Gottlieb Burkhardt, a Swiss physician, performs a similar operation on six schizophrenic patients. Four exhibited altered behavior, two died. 1936, neuropsychiatrist Antonio Igis Menez develops the leukotomy, but advises using the operation only as a last resort. 1945, American surgeon Walter Freeman develops the ice pick lobotomy, performed under a local anesthetic, takes only a few minutes, and involves driving a pick through the thin bone of the eye socket, then manipulating it to damage damage the prefrontal lobes. 1946, first lobotomy performed in Britain at Merrifield, Hospital Dundee. Procedure is used for 30 years. 1954, antipsychotic drug Thorazine licensed for the treatment of schizophrenia, causing the lobotomy to gradually fall out of the favor. 1960 to 1970, lobotomies come under scrutiny by sociologists who consider it a tool for psycho-civilizing society. They were banned in Germany, Japan, and the Soviet Union. Limited psychosurgery for extreme medical cases is still practiced in the UK, Finland, India, Sweden, Belgium, and Spain. What do you think? You think about Dr. Freeman's work. I know a few people that could use a lobotomy myself, but yeah, that's fucked up. I don't know. Scrambling someone's eggs is probably not a good thing to do. Different world, different times, I guess. Anyways, you get a chance, make sure you're following us on all the social media accounts. Everything's under The Sinful Show. Also, we have a Facebook group. It's The Sinful Society formerly known as Sinful Nation. Bunch of sinners in there already. I think we're at almost 2,000 sinners in there. Yeah, jump in there. Start some conversations. Make new friends. All are welcome. Stay sinful, my friends. Also, you get a chance. 
help me out drop me a five-star review on that itunes don't leave me no bullshit ones that don't help me <laughs> anyways for everyone that does listen i appreciate it. it means the world to me stay simple my friends I don't think anyone has the right to take the